The impossible dream, the Boston Red Sox. A tribute to a team and a town, and a tribute to that sun-drenched, wind-burned, sore-throated fraternity, the baseball fans of New England. In this jet age, when you report baseball, you come to no airports. You know them in the quiet hours before the dawn, when only a cleaning man or two seems to notice you have come to his city after a night game 300 miles away. And the man with the broom does not seem to care. Or you know the airport bustle of the late afternoon as you crowd your way toward the airplane after an afternoon game in Detroit on to California and a twinighter tomorrow. It's a jet age when Connie Mack's beloved athletics have long since moved from the shadow of the Liberty Bell. And in a jet age baseball story such as this, it seems fitting that the first chapter of the story of the team, which was to become the 1967 Red Sox, had as its setting, not the base paths of a baseball diamond, but the runways of an airport. On this September day, as another season out of the baseball sun was grinding toward a close, a man named Dick Williams came to town. This was the man who would mold the dream. A young leader with the face of a choir boy, the heart of a lion tamer, and the nerve of a riverboat gambler. He would return to the airport many times in the year which was to follow, and it would not always be a lonely place. What was it that happened in this year? Why did the airport arrival of a team of professional baseball players become a cause for community celebration? Why would the waiting room of an airport suddenly become the place to shout greetings to an outfielder or rub shoulders with a second baseman or just to smile at a pitcher? The story of what happened will long be told around Boston for it is a story worth the telling. You'd have to call it really, a love story, an affair twixt a town and a team, a town that had waited and waited for what seemed an impossible dream. Gentlemen, we're very pleased to introduce a fellow that is known to all of you, our new manager, a man we think will do a great job for the Boston Red Sox, and we're looking forward to the coming season immediately. Dick Williams. Thank you, Dick. Uh, being here uh, is quite a pleasure, I'll tell you. I've had two years' experience managing. Uh, I consider this quite a challenge. Sully and I will do uh, a lot of talking in the next few days, along with Dick. And uh, the only thing I can tell you right now, I'll guarantee you we'll have a hustling ball club. And uh, they won't quit. They didn't quit on me in Toronto. I don't intend to have anybody quit on me here. Dick, will you make a prediction for the 1967 Red Sox? I honestly think we'll win more ball games than we lose. The story had its beginnings under the Florida sun. The odds makers looked them over and said, 100 to 1. New faces in the lineup, showing off their skill. They got the Williams message. If you came to play, you will. Kids fresh up from the minors. Veterans looking for a spot. If you want to make this ball club, you give it all you've got. The philosophy is changing. The new manager's stepping in. They're learning a baseball lesson. It's much more fun to win. They came north to Frosty Fenway and won the opening game. And the fans began to sense it. This year was not quite the same. Reggie Smith, an outfielder by trade, was at second base in the opener, both defensively and offensively. Then, the other half of the opening day double play combination, as you see Reggie Smith at second base, Rico Petroselli came to the plate. Sent the first run across the Fenway Park plate. A.G. throws home, but Smith is safe. Petroselli, the fans shouted, come on, Rico kid, put it in the nets, and that's exactly what he did.
Then they travel to Yankee Stadium for an early April game. A kid pitcher up from Toronto knocked on the door of fame. Roar winds. Here it comes. Fly ball to deep left. Yastrzemski is going hard. Way back, way back. And he dives and makes a tremendous catch. Billy Rohr gets ready to work to Joe Pepitone. One out in the Yankee ninth inning. Rohr is two outs away. The pitch to Joe. Inside for a ball. Yankee first baseman waiting on Rohr. Russ Gibson working back of the plate. Fly ball toward right field. Canigliaro. And two out in the Yankee ninth inning. Tension at Yankee Stadium now as Elston Howard stands up there. The count works up to three balls and two strikes. The Red Sox dug out on edge. Rohr looking in to get the sign from Russ Gibson. The scoreboard tells the story. The pitch to Howard hit into right field. It's a base hit. And the no hit try is broken up. As Howard on a 3-2 pitch with two out in the ninth inning, singles cleanly into right field. Rohr now ready to work to Charlie Smith, the Yankee third baseman. Young left-hander. Getting set. Howard at first base, Scott holding at the bag against him. The pitch to Smith. Fly ball into right field. Canigliaro makes the catch and the ball game is over. And the Red Sox bench on loads as they come out to greet Billy Rohr, a one hitter in his first major league start. It won't last, said the experts. They'll never stand the pace. But toward the end of April, guess who gained first place? And the Red Sox have won it. In 15 innings, the Red Sox pull it out 11 to 10 and go into a tie for first place in the American League. As Jose Tarnable is mobbed by his teammates going off. As April's day stretched into May's, there were new bridges to be crossed, but they kept their manager's promise. They won more than they lost. Now the fans began to talk more with each victory that was won. It was more than just a slogan. Being there was twice the fun. Remember that day against Cleveland? Base hit for Jones. With hit and run and double steal, the Boston kids were heard, and they stayed up in the thick of things. Now fifth, now fourth, now third. At times, the team would falter. It seems they'd hit the skids, but they sounded attack and came battling back. They called them the cardiac kids. Take that night in June, for example. 
They were scoreless for 10 innings, and Eddie Stanky's White Sox pushed across a run on the top of the 11. Joe Foy got a single, but there were still two men out. Then glory be Tony C unleashed a mighty cloud. The ball, it soars. The crowd, it roars. A towering home run. As teammates wait at home plate, we've won it two to one. They were becoming known as a fighting ball club. And one night in New York, they proved it. High in the air into short left field. Yastrzemski making a long run. Watch out, Carl. He makes the catch. saying something and you can see some of the Yankees coming out and from that point on it started. Then it's back to baseball and Longborg hasn't lost the touch. He fans Horace Clark. And Smith had a base hit last time but tried to stretch it into a double and was thrown out. There is ball one and Smith now points out toward the mound. the first snappy double play pulled off. That was a little high at the moment though. Well, there's a... <laughs> Gave him a shave on that one. Good. Same type of hit. Smith safe. Back to third. Out. Amal making the tie. And Mambo Kett is going to argue on the play at first base. Bill uh, figured they had it to Nigliaro at first. And you can kind of tell, can't you? <laughs> now Ralph Houck is coming out to the first base umpire. Bill Haller, who is getting an earful from him. On the play, a run scored. To Nigliaro. will get credit for... Run better, and now Hawk is out of the game. The All Star game break came, and this surprising team sent four of its players to the big game at Anaheim Yastrzemski, Lonborg, Petroselli, and Canigliaro. It won't last, said the experts. They haven't got the speed. But it's All Star break, 
And for heaven's sake, we're just six from the lead. Then back to friendly Fenway, a hot streak in July. Pennant fever's setting in and the fever's running high. One. And there's ball four. Four, Snyder waiting on the call from Honachek. So the first two men are on for Baltimore. Feeling it, throwing it in, and Reggie Smith starts it off for the Red Sox. The big pitch. Slammed in the left field. Willie Harden can't get it, takes it on the hop. A base hit for Mike Ryan. Reggie Smith moves up to second base. The Red Sox have two on now with nobody out. Back to the box. Farmer has it to play the third. Not in time. And the ball gets away from Don Wirt. Bounced over Wirt's head in the left field. Reggie Smith comes on to score. The ball gets away from Harden, and now Mike Ryan. High fly ball to left field. Will Willie have room? He don't. Into the netting for a home run. One and one. One and two. And he strikes him out to end it. Another strikeout for Lyle. The next night, they ran the Tiger ragged. That's ripped. Stanley looking up, and Joe Foy has hit one off the wall. Andrews coming around, and Foy is second with a double. Can win them in your own yard can you win them on the road just watch them go ten in a row the whole team shares the load as the team heads on the road trip each fan sings the song through the broadcasts and in spirit please take me along <laughs> take me out to Baltimore Weld stroke to left field. That's fair ball, and that is going to be gone. A home run for Andrews. What a shot. Mike Andrews puts the Red Sox ahead with a three-run homer. His fourth of the year. Runs batted in 19, 20, and 21. And he'll get quite a reception from Reggie Smith and Mike Ryan. And watch him as he goes to the dugout. He's going to make it two for three now into the gap and a ground rule double as it bounces over the fence. Boy is starting to hit. 
Well hit to right field. Lefrey will not be able to get that one. It's bounding past him on the carom for extra bases. Two runs have scored. Tony's trying for three, and he's got him. A triple for Canigliaro to the opposite field. Here's Canigliaro with a double and a triple and three trips. And this one uh, may go for at least two, maybe more. Tony going around second base. Here's the throw to third, and he is safe at third base with a triple. Line drive to right. Canigliaro makes the catch, and the Red Sox win it, making it two in a row here in Baltimore. As they take it six to four, they've now won six straight, eight of their last nine, as they continue to run hot in this American League pennant race. Take me out to Cleveland. Three Cleveland hits. Yastrzemski calls off a dare and makes the catch. One out in the ninth. Horton is out, two down in the ninth inning. Line drive toward Thomas. He's got it, and the Red Sox do it again as they down the Cleveland Indians on a superb pitching job turned in by Lee Stang. Look at them go, ten in a row. Long drive to left center. Davileo is back to the fence. And it is gone for a home run. Finigliaro puts the Red Sox on top, two to nothing. This may be good for a couple. May after the ball, and Adair going around first and on to second. Easy double for Jerry Adair. And with the bases full, Joe Foy is up. by Joe Foy, and this one is a grand slam. As the season lengthens into August, the Red Sox refuse to fold. The pitching comes through to pick them up whenever their bats grow cold. Sure, the Tigers lead. Chicago has speed, and the Twins still have Oliva. But with Yaz and Scott and what we've got, just feel that pennant fever. Then one August night, the kid in right lies sprawling in the dirt. The fastball struck him square. He's down. Tony's badly hurt. The doctors say he'll be OK, but he won't be back this year. With Tony through, what can they do? Who'll carry them from here? <laughs> Yaz comes through. Mike Andrews, too. They're winning them with style. Lonborg and Bell are pitching well. And there's Wyatt. And there's Lyle. They need the wins to match the Twins, the Tigers, and Chicago. Rico, Jones, Adair, Foy, Stang, and Santiago. No one player does the job. Each day, a different hero. The comeback against the Angels after trailing 8-0. to zero. There are two men out now in the ninth inning for the California Angels. Ground ball to Adair. Over to second. This Sunday's hero gets the final out in a doubleheader sweep. It was Adair's eighth inning home run, which climaxed the comeback, gave the Red Sox a 9 to 8 second game win after they trailed 8 to nothing. Then there was that big weekend in Chicago. <laughs> He's done it again. Adair comes through in the clutch, and the Red Sox lead 1-0. Yastrzemski makes the catch. Goes to the opposite field, maybe trouble. Colavito won't be able to get it. Bouncing toward the wall. There's Rocky digging it out. And the throw coming in, it's going to be a triple for Ryan. A run batted in as Andrews scores. Popped up, Rico Petroselli and Mike Andrews, and it is Mike who's got it. And the Red Sox 
are on top again. The next day, the little fellow in right threw a strike you had to see twice to believe. Here's Barry. Lines one to left for a base hit. And is in the second base with a double. Ken Berry gets the first pitch and lines it past the glove of Adair at third for a double. The butt grabbed by Scott. He goes to first and gets him on a close play. George looked toward third and then sorry he didn't have it, so he went over to Andrews covering first. Coming is getting the call. And going out to the mound is Dick Williams. Josephson is batting 307 with 31 hits and 101 at bats. And he is going to make the change here and go to Wyatt. Well, Josephson's up there and the Red Sox infield is in with one out and the runner at third base in the ninth inning. There is Barry. There's a drive into right field, caught by Tarnable, runner tags. Here's the throw home, and he is out at the plate! He is out at home! And There's a drive into right field, caught by Tarnable, runner tags. Here's the throw home, and he is out at the plate! He is out at home! The pennant race maintains its pace. The pressure's great, it seems. Now only one percentage point divides the four top teams. If you want to win, you have to hold that tiger. George Scott gets a base hit. Here comes Tarnable around third. Mickey Stanley throws. He is safe at home. And the Red Sox have tied it up. The pitch gets away. Here comes Yastrzemski. And the Red Sox lead. Three to two. Scott moves to third and Jones goes to second. Fly ball to right field. Scott going back and tagging up. Kaline makes the catch. Here's the throw. And he is safe at home. And you have to fight off those Indians. Well hit toward left center. It is out of here. Home run, number 41 for Yastrzemski. Adair makes the stop. Throws to Scott for the out. Another sparkling play by Jerry Adair. Line drive, base hit into center. Reggie Smith up with the ball, and Alvis has his third hit of the night. Ground ball to Petroselli, hit slowly, throws to second for one, back to first. Out for a double play, and the Red Sox end it. With a week to go, you have to cage the Orioles if you want to crack at the Cardinals. Louis Aparicio lifts a fly to Thomas in left. He's got it. The Red Sox have their sixth victory on an eight-game trip, and Jose Santiago walks off the field, the winning pitcher for the third of those six vital victories. The days grow few. We're down to two at home against the Twins. We must win both. The dream is through if Minnesota wins. Check swing roller. Fine throw, safe. Mike Andrews. Checking the swing has himself an infield hit. His second of the day. With one out in the seventh, there is one on, and the batter is Jerry Adair. 
Klein. Straight. Doyle over Sias. Now it's down to just one game. Win it or you're through. Just one more game to clinch a tie. The impossible dream come true. The standings tell the story. Tell it at a glance. To clinch at least a pen and tie, the Sox must beat Dean Chance. Dean Chance has pitched a four-hit shutout so far. Good bunt. And he can't play it. Bunch single for Lonborg to lead off the sixth inning. Hey, Dare is 0 for 2, facing Chance. 2 0, Twins lead sixth inning. Crowd coming alive. And this is a base hit to center. Lonborg will hold at second. Two on, none out. A big moment in the ball game for the Red Sox right now. Swinging away, base hit to left. Ron Board being held at third base, and they're loaded up. and tense looking at the action. Base hit to center. Lonborg scores. Adair will score. It's tied up. Kenny Harrelson, the batter, with two on and none out. 2-2 two, two is the score. Yaz will go to second. A run will score. And Harrelson will leave now, and Tartable will run for him. Here comes Cal Irmer out. The Red Sox lead it three to two. This is Worthington's sixth appearance against Boston. No wins, one loss. Ball getting away from Zimmerman and the runners move up. There it goes, gets away. A run will score. Four to two. One out, two on. Killebrew has it knock off his leg. That'll be another run. You landed for one to throw to first in time. A double play. Now as Rich Rollins moves to the plate to face Jim Lonborg. Little soft pop up. Petroselli will take it. He does. Thomas Austin Yonke, owner, sportsman, fan. Baseball lives in Boston through the efforts of this man. Tom, 
How do you feel at this moment? We honestly don't know anything beyond the fact that they have tied for the finish. But that how is do you correct. Feel? I feel terrifically thrilled about the whole thing, I'll tell you. I know that a midway through the season, you and I talked, and I asked you how you compared this club with your 46, and you said this one gave you a bigger kick. <laughs> they gave you a lot of big kicks, didn't they? Well, I'll say they did, and uh, as I think I told you then, this was a young club, and they came all from a long ways back. The 46 club was a veteran club. Came back from the service, practically all of them, and uh, they got jumped off to a big lead. I think with 40, we won 41 out of our first 50 games. And I think this club is uh, three games over 500, I think, at the All-Star break. So uh, I don't think there's much question. I mean, whether this club gave me a lot bigger kick than the 46 club, does although it, that was a big one, too. Does it make up for the 49 disappointment? Well, in this game, you have disappointments, and you're going to have them. But uh, yes, I would say I would say that it uh, it did make up for that at uh, 48 and 49. Right. They were both close races. You remember? Well, you you deserve it no matter what happens, Tom. You're, well, you're a great credit to Boston, and it's always been a delight to know you. Well, it's wonderful to be here, and I'm particularly happy to be here today. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Doc. What's this for? Do you have a child or something? <laughs> We're having a perfect day. Yes, yes. What? What? what Light it up. Red all back. <laughs> what can I say? What? Look, seven for eight in the final two biggest games of your life. You're too much. <laughs> I was just trying the uh, best I could, Don, and uh, I had something going for me. I wanted to win it for Mr. Yaki. Uh, he deserved it. How, how do you account for having such a phenomenal year? <laughs> I mean, is it just one of those things where you feel every time you go up that you're going to get a base hit? I just felt great physically. Uh, felt confident at the beginning of the year because I felt so great physically doing all those exercises. Uh, I graduated from college last winter. I didn't have to worry about it during the winter time, going back to studies or anything. I had a winter to uh, rest and relax, and uh, I just felt great when I started spring training. It, it must give you, a, or are you used yet to being the super, super, superstar? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, super, super, super. <laughs> but I just feel great. It's great. Now all we have to do is sweat out that second game. But it, anyway, it's uh, it's a phenomenal year that's been climaxed by at least a tie for the American League. Yes, it has. And uh, knowing uh, Mr. Rigney and the California Angels, uh, they're going to give the Tigers a battle. They're going to give them a battle. And no matter what happens. Yeah, it's a great year, and uh, we're going to be battling uh, the Tigers if uh, we have to play them in the playoff. Good luck to you. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Thank you. You had it all the way, huh? Had it all the way, just like we've had had them all year long. We fought from behind all year long, and they did it again today. Were you uh, were you getting concerned when it was getting around the fifth uh, inning and you hadn't scored as yet? Well, we were hitting uh, the ball pretty good off chance and not having any luck. So uh, the way things turned out, uh, we stayed with them all the way, and they start falling in. Yaz had another one of his brilliant days, defensively, offensively, everything, and. Uh, the ball club in general uh, has been fabulous all year long, and, and they just did it again, Don. Now, on uh, on Wednesday, you'll start Lombard, will you? Uh, we've got to root the Angels home now. I hear they're behind 2-1 to one at the end of 2. It's a long ball game, just like ours. And uh, we hope to get them out of there. And uh, if we could win this thing free and clear today, then it would probably be... Uh, San Diego open up and Lomborg would go Thursday. I get you. So he get his three days rest. Yes. And, and if there is a playoff, uh, who will go tomorrow? For Stang you? is ready to go tomorrow. Okay. Good luck. Williams, Yastrzemski, and Lomborg. Yastrzemski, Williams, and Lomborg. Choose any billing you wish. The fact remains they led a team in a single season from half a game out of the cellar to a pennant. Again to the locker room. Remember, the Tigers still have a chance to tie. Here is the magic moment as the clubhouse radio told an anxious audience it was pennant, not playoff, for the remarkable Red Sox. Brunette ready, delivers. He swings and pops it up. Back of the short left, going back for Gossi. Coming in Woody Hell, the left fielder makes the catch for the out. <laughs>
so now the 1967 American League season was over. The impossible dream had come true. For the first time in 21 years, the Red Sox were in the World Series. As was the case in 1946, the last time Boston had won a pennant, they faced the St. Louis Cardinals. Yes, the Cardinals of St. Louis with their Gibsons, Floods, and Brocks, a rated heavy favorites to beat the battling, hustling Sox. Fans were in, over, and around proud old Fenway Park on a beautiful autumn day. Carl Yastrzemski, still making the big plays, throws the madly sprinting Julian Javier out at the plate. And later, Yaz robbed Kurt Flood of a double. But the larcenist Lou Brock scored both of his team's runs. He literally stole the game. And Brock's runs were enough for the overpowering Bob Gibson. The Cards won it 2-1. to one. Lonborg and Yastrzemski led the way in the second game. Yaz hit two home runs. The first off starter Dick Hughes. The second, a three-run wallop off left-hander Joe Horner. In his first World Series start, Jim Lonborg flirted with immortality. Kurt Flood walked in the seventh inning, and he became the first Cardinal base runner. And Julian Javier made the only hit off Lomborg in the eighth inning. And the series was tied one to one. On to St. Louis. Third baseman Mike Shannon turned slugger to account for the winning run. With a two run homer in the second inning against right hander Gary Bell. Nelson Bryles stopped Yastrzemski and St. Louis won five to two and led in games two to one. Lou Brock demonstrated the meaning of leg hit in the first inning of the fourth game. When Kurt Flood singled, the Cardinals had two men on against Jose Santiago, and Roger Maris leading RBI man in the series, double to left. Brock and Flood sped home. Bob Gibson spun a shutout. The Cardinals had a three to one series lead. The Cardinals, they said, would do it in five. But Ken Harrelson drove in a third inning run. Then Elston Howard batted in another in the ninth. And card right fielder Maris threw in a third. Jim Lonborg did the rest. He held St. Louis to three hits and one run, a homer in the ninth by Maris. When Joe Foy threw out Cepeda, the Sox trailed in games two to three. Back to Fenway. Backs to the wall until Rico Petroselli put one over it. And Yastrzemski. And Reggie Smith. And Petroselli again. The long ball had brought the Red Sox a long way back, all the way to a seventh game. They just sat there, and they waited for the final game to start. How to find words to say it, this gripping at the heart. For they had cheered since April, this young and hustling crew. Now they sat, section 9, row 12, seats 1 and 2. One said, Lonnie looks tired. The other said, Gibson's strong. They joined the shout as their team raced out. The team they had cheered so long. And they saw it happening. In the October sun. As they sat, section nine, row 12, seats two and one. The Cardinals are the champions. That's what the scoreboard said. But seat one looked at two. Quietly, he shook his head. 
I've been to losing games before, he said. He paused, his throat to clear. These kids are not losers. Boy, the throws they gave this year. And C2 nodded wisely and barely looked around. Did you notice at the end, he said, they had young Brett on the mound. Oh, uh, they'll be back next season. No telling what they'll do. And seat one put his hand on the shoulder of seat two. And off they walked from Fenway. With memories of this team, which ran and hit and never quit. And forged an impossible dream. Mm -hmm.